Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming. I want to introduce you to our very special guest, Rabbi Lawrence Hadjioff. I've had the pleasure of knowing him since I was 12 years old. Um, he currently teaches at Stern and is a rabbi for Chazak and at the Safra Synagogue in Manhattan. He's here visiting us from New York, and we're very happy to have him. I love him. He married me and my wife, and he's been a big part of my life, so I'm happy right. to have him here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mabrook, Mabrook. Thank you so much. Shalom Abracha, welcome everyone. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me in your wonderful, beautiful community. First of all, a big thank you. Always open with thanks to our hosts, to Lou and Adele Ezrick for opening and sponsoring and making this happen. And Rabbi Masri as well, who had to go to Argentina for, uh, for an event, but a big thank you to him for opening his Bet Kenneth, beautiful Bet Knesset, and your Bet Knesset should grow goodwilling with lots of Torah Amen. and lots of Tehillim, because my friends, right now, as we're going to discuss this evening, the greatest thing we can do is bring more Tefillah to Klal and Am Yisrael. I don't have to tell you, we are living in crazy times. Crazy. My wife, and I had a bit of a screaming recently. I'm very happy in Maribach. I'm very much in love. Don't worry. But my wife, I wanted to go to Israel for Sukkot. I've not been in 30 years because we have a big sukkah. And we have a lot of people who come to my sukkah. And my wife said, no, let's stay home because we have guests. I said, but I want to go to Israel. I want to enjoy. She said, we're going to stay here. And we have In the end, Somehow, we managed to end up after 30 years not being there for Sukkot, for Sukkot. Everything's going great. I was at the Kotel for Birchat Kohanim, which is such a... If you haven't experienced this, my friends, it is the greatest experience a Jew can have. Besides buying on sale at Costco, but besides that, Birchat Kohanim and the Kotel, everyone <coughs> prays together. Everyone says Kaddish and this. Hundreds of thousands of Kohanim giving you brachot. It was amazing. And then we woke up Shabbat morning. I'm at the hotel right next to the Tachan It was where I was working as a rabbi in the program. And we hear boom, boom above us. And we thought we didn't know what it was. And then we found out what it was. The Kitsur, we spent the entire day visiting soldiers who had been dropped off at the central bus station on their way to Aza, and we brought them food, and we brought them drinks, and we organized blood donations, and it was packed with thousands of soldiers. And I made my wife and kids see this. And I didn't know what to do, my friends. I didn't know what to do. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna sing for them, we dance a little bit. I put my hand and my onto every single one of their heads and gave them a bracha that they should return them safely. Because my friends, tefillah, I'm gonna to prove to you this evening, is going to be the answer to a lot of our challenges we're dealing with today, very specifically. Okay, let me tell you what I'm gonna do this evening. I have a million things to tell you, so much to say, but I'm gonna divide it up. The idea of this talk is we're gonna talk about Mashiach. You know, I wrote a book about four or five years ago, Mashiach, it sold Baruch Hashem when I came out. It was my third book, three, four hundred copies. And then, for three years, garnished. Here, there, 30, 50. Yeah. In the past week and a half, we've sold 900. And we have another three, four hundred on back order. We have to print new ones. There's a feeling in the air. People know. Religious people, secular people, and Lahabd al Goyim, they understand that something big is happening in the world. And they're right, because it is. So we're going to talk about Mashiach a little bit. What to expect, because my friends, I'm going to show you, Mizrash this evening, we're getting very close. And you know this. I'm not a, it's a Sephardi Beth Knesset. Of course you know this, right? You know, I get asked a lot of questions, Baruch Hashem. So I get people ask me questions on Kashrut, some of these WhatsApp groups, you know, I'm on social media, a lot of questions. And I get someone come to me and say, Rabbi, I had a dream last night. The first question I ask is, are you Sephardi? Because if a Sephardi woman has a dream and she has a question, I listen carefully. Ashkenazi, I might possibly. 
Maybe yes, maybe no. But a Sephardi woman, she talks Sephardi, then we know that something big is happening in the world. We have a chush of an understanding of this. We're going to talk a little bit about Ishmael, which is, we're going to talk about the challenge we're dealing with today. Then we're going to talk about the difference between Ishmael and Amalek, because they're also raising their heads very brazenly right now, more than I've seen ever in my lifetime. And then we'll talk, Bizrat Hashem, a little bit about Gog and Magog, what that's going to be like. And then we'll finish with Dibre Baracha. So that's going to be the event this evening. Are we ready for this experience? Yeah. I want to download as much information as I can into your heads. And God willing, Bizrat Hashem, inshallah, in the schut of this learning, we'll see Bizrat Hashem, every single hostage come home, Shalem, every soldier come home, and finally all of our enemies. Wiped out. Can you still say that? Yes, I'm so. Bezrat Hashem. Okay. Yes. Jewish history has a beginning, has a middle, and an end. <coughs> beginning, middle, and end. Now, the maximum of time that world history can exist, we know, is 6,000 years. And that 6,000 is divided into three groups. 2,000, 2,000, and 2,000. The first 2,000 are called Tova Vogel which is a borrowed expression from creation, from Bereshit. Everything was absolutely bewilderment. It was crazy. And then came 1948. 1948 in the Jewish calendar. Comes along Avram Avinu. And he starts the second <coughs> group of 2000, which is called Yomata Torah. Because within the 2000, the Torah was given. That's a Jewish year 2, 4, 4, 8. And that continued... The last 2000 is called Yomot HaMashiach. The time the Mashiach can arrive. Just like any good story has a beginning, middle, and end, history is the same. This is hinted, I say, the rabbis in the first Pasuk in the Torah. We read a couple of weeks ago. In that Pasuk, one letter appears six times. Does anyone here know, for an extra piece of sushi afterwards, which letter? Appears in the first pasuk of the Torah six times. Uh, Not Vav? Aleph. Who said Aleph? Excellent. My ex student who said Baruch Hashem. Yes. Aleph. The Aleph appears six times. Now, if you say Aleph, you can also change the vowels and it becomes Aleph. Aleph is one and Aleph is a thousand. Same letter, same order, different vowels. So one equals a thousand. And the rabbi said this is a hint that the world can only exist exists for 6,000 years. Comes along, I'm building up over here, stick with me my friends. Comes along Yeshua Navi, Isaiah the prophet, chapter 60 at the end. And he says, that's true. But there are two possible times Mashiach can come. And he tells us two words to summarize this very big idea. Be'ito, achishem. Be'ito means in its time, he's going to come which most rabbis, including the Ramban, say must come at the 6,000th. But then he says we have the ability to achishena, to hasten, to bring earlier the end of the galut. How? We're going to talk about this evening. There are certain specific events and certain specific mitzvot that we can do, specific ones, that can bring the galut to the end. Fast than before. So there's an outer time and there's an inner time. Okay. Okay. Next. We know that we are in the year 5784. So we're getting close. I'll tell you something pretty wild, by the way. I haven't mentioned this too often because it freaks people out a little bit. There is a Vilna Gaon, and I have the source at home, that says, you know, how many Pusukim? Are there in the entire Torah? Five, eight, four, five. Very good. Five, eight, four, five. Call a couple. I remember that because where I live in Monty, New York, our phone code is eight, four, five. So I remember. Five people. I told a Hasid this once. Got very excited. Five, eight, four, five is the amount of pasukim in the Torah. The Vilnius says every pasuk in the Torah is equal to a year. So pasuk one is year one. Pasuk two is year two. <coughs> Pasuk 5 is year, you get in the pattern. Pasuk 50 is year 50. Pasuk 500 is 500. He says, not only that, you can see 
some of the major events in that year reflected in the Pasuk. It's even wilder. It happens to be that this year's Pasuk, I'm going to read it to you very quickly, Mechila. I have to do it inside, because it's in Parshat Hazinu, the end of Devarim, because it's the end of the Torah. And in chapter 32 of Devarim, Pasuk 32, it says the following. Ki, this is this year's. Ki migefen Sodom gafnam, we shabbat with memorah. We're dealing with a vineyard of Sodom and Amorah. It's not good, it's challenging. Gafnam, Shabbat, Morah, Nevemah, Yivari Rosh, Ashkelon, Morah, Namah. It's not a good time. It's challenging like, like bitter grapes. Now, the next passage, which is next year, if you're Ashkenazi, which most of you are not, but they read the next word as Hamas. Tanini Mienam. They're like serpents. We're going to be dealing for the next year with serpents and great challenges. <laughs> Barosh Petanim Achzar, dealing with very cruel people. The year after that, however, is the next passage. <coughs> Halo hu kamusimadi. Halo means what? Well, isn't it inside with me, says Hashem? Hidden away, but in my treasure house. This passage is famous among Chazal for describing the third and final Bet Migdash. Maybe yes, maybe no. What's interesting, says the Rambam, the third and final Beit HaMikdash is actually going to be a proof that Mashiach is Mashiach. He's going to have to do a number of things. There's a number of tests that Mashiach is going to have to have in order to be Mashiach. One of the biggest ones, he says, that will put him to the, into the category of absolute Mashiach, he's going to build the third and final temple of Beit HaMikdash. Until this war, I used to say, as I'm going to show you this evening, that everyone's going to know Mashiach is Mashiach. We're all going to accept him. And they'll give us Harabai, they'll give us Temple Mount. They'll be like, here you go. Vakasha, it's yours. In the past two weeks, I changed my tune. I've evolved my thinking, as they say. It's going to be much, much harder. Okay. Let's go back, and we'll tie this all together to where we are right now. Yaakov Avinu stood, actually, he slept on a mountain in Harabai, the place where his grandfather, Abraham, brought his father, Yitzchak, to the Akedah. Sound familiar? You know the story. It's coming up at the parashiyot right now. When he was there, he fell asleep. And the rabbis made a big deal out of this because this was the first sleep he had in a long time because he was preparing to go and leave Israel to enter Galut. Yaakov represents Galut. That's why this episode takes place at nighttime. Nighttime represents Galut. We're in darkness right now. So there is Yaakov Avinu. He gets and he falls asleep. We know she told the sleeping schedule, are we? of our avot and imaot, but this is obviously an important sleep, because he has a dream. Come, the seat's over here. Come, Baruch oh, okay. How are you doing? Welcome, bro. Nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you, well. Let's grab a seat from inside. Be comfortable. So he has a dream. Yaakov's on the mountain. In the dream, my friends, he sees a, what does he see? A sulam, a ladder. And the ladder is based on earth, and it goes up to the heavens. And on this ladder, he sees four angels. Each one of these angels goes up a certain amount of runs, then comes down again. These four angels, say the rabbis, represent the four exiles the Jewish people have been through in history. So the first angel represents the Babylonian exile. Nebuchadnezzar came, destroyed the first temple of Shlomo HaMelech, of King Solomon and exiled us out. And that angel walked up 70 rungs and then went down again. And now we're in between the first and second temple period. And we're dealing with Parasomadai, the Persian and Median one. That's the whole Purim story. Remember, Purim happened between the destruction of the first temple and the building of the second temple. Sound familiar? The majority of the Jewish people were in Persia. Actually, they were in the capital of Persia, which is great neck. Now, <laughs> those who know, know. After this, he saw a third angel. And this third angel went up, and this represented the Greek exile. And that was 52, because that's how long that lasted for. The Greek exile was when the Greeks came to Israel. The story of Alexander the Great. Actually, I met a young boy called Alexander today. Was that your kid? It wasn't your kid, no. There was a kid called Alexander I was hanging out today. And by the way, if you ever meet a child called Alexander, you should know that when Alexander the Great came to Israel, had a big showdown 
right, with the Jewish people. He was accepted, and he ended up with Shemit. Having a good relation with the Jewish people, they made a decree that for one year, every Jewish boy that was born had to be called Alexander. So every Alexander you meet today is actually probably a descendant of the original Alexander the Great all the way back, right? Named Ben Ben, that that name was added in. The final angel, my friends, represented the fourth exile. It would be the three exiles, Babylonian, Persian, and Median. We have the Greek exile, which is weird because we were in Israel during that exile, which proved to us that you can be in Israel, have possession of Israel, and still be considered galut, still be in exile. That's interesting. We're going to talk more about that in a few moments. The final angel that Jacob saw, this is the prophecy of all of Jewish history. By the way, why was it shown to him and not his grandfather Abraham? Because his grandfather Abraham had a son called Ishmael. So he had to make a distinction. So show it to Yitzhak, his brother, Abraham's son. Come here, because he had an Esau. However, Yaakov, Jacob, was the one who became Yisrael. That's why his name was changed. Because all of his kids ended up as part of the tribe. Actually, literally tribes. Twelve of them. Ruby, Chilma, Levi, Yudisaka, By the way, we only have a couple of tribes now. All of us today, for the most part, although the Ethiopian Jews, Ethiopian Jews say they come from uh, Dan, and other Jews, Menashe, the Indian Jews, maybe yes, maybe no. Actually, one of the jobs, <laughs> I'm jumping around a little bit, I hope you don't mind. One of the jobs of Mashiach, he's going to have a very specific prophetic power, says Isaiah the prophet, that is going to allow him to determine which tribe you are from. And that's important, because it could be that depends where you're going to live in the land of Israel. That's also going to determine whether you're a Kohen or a Levi. He's also going to use that prophetic sense of smell. That's what it's called. It's unique to him. It's actually one of the ways you can determine whether he actually is the Messiah. Bar Kokhba was claimed by many to be the Messiah. They tested him. The Talmud tells us this with his prophetic form of smell. Be'ericho b'yirat Hashem is the wording from the prophet. And they tested him and he failed. And he was put aside, let's say. So Mashiach is going to be tested. If he passes this test, he's going to use this prophetic ability to also determine whether Samba is Jewish or not. You should know. There's a lot of people out there who think they're Jewish who are actually not, or who don't they're Jewish and actually are. I've met many such individuals. I led a trip uh, to Poland. About once a year, I did like a Holocaust trip. Maybe five or six of them I've led. And we had a young kid with us. And he says, oh, I want to go visit the Warsaw Cemetery, which, by the way, is going to sound weird. It's one of the coolest places to visit, right? It's a massive cemetery. It goes back, honestly, there's thousands of Jews there, a lot of Jewish history there. So we went to the cemetery. He goes, oh, my great grandfather's buried over here. I come to his tombstone. I'm like, this is your fault. You've got to get out. He's like, why? It's a cemetery. You can't keep me out of cemetery. It's not a club. I'm like, yes, I can, brother. This is your father's fault. Yeah, I said, you're a Kohen. Right? A lot of people don't know, they don't realize. A lot of people, the last thing Kohen know are not Kohen. Him. So, all of this is going to be much of what Mashiach is going to do. His main job we're going to see, or hmm, oh, you're going to see it, <laughs> is to wipe out all of anti Semitism, Shibud Malchiot, is how the rabbis describe it, from the world. That's going to go. The Jewish people are going to go willing, all of us, although I've had different people come back at me and get upset with this, saying this may not be true. There's different opinions, but I'm going to go with the opinion that every Jew is going to go back. There's no Jew left behind. He's going to go and live in the land of Israel. And in case you don't think there's enough room in Israel, there's plenty of room right now. Up, down, Golan, Negev, plenty of room. And Israel's going to be much larger, much larger. That is, the biblical Israel goes whoop to the side. After Damascus, up to Syria, Jews going to be in, in, cover a much larger area. So do not worry. You have as many citizens in Israel, you have that's one apartment building in Brooklyn, for goodness sakes. Plenty of room for all the Jewish people of Israel Tashim. Okay. Let's go a little bit deeper. Are you with me so far, friends? So we see there's four exiles. The final angel that represents the fourth exile, because each one went up and came down, was the Roman Edom. And that one was going up and up and up, and it didn't come down. So Yaakov started to freak out and said, oh no. That exile is never going to end. And he's like, don't worry, even now it's going to end. Hashem says it's going to be a much longer exile, been a couple of thousand years. 
And that's what I did when I was in Yeshiva, as taught us. And then I started to do some more research and I found an unbelievable piece of Torah, which some of you may have heard, but I'm going to double click on it right now. And it goes like this. So I'm Rav Chaim Vital. He wrote a commentary on Tehillim. And he mentions one Tehillim, which is actually one, two, four, which by the way, I keep telling people, if you want to fight Yishmael, right, which is the Arabs today, for the most part, those who are against us, there's good Yishmael, there's bad Yishmael, by the way. We're going to make a distinction. There's good and bad. There's good Nesav and bad Nesav. There's only bad Amalek, by the way. <laughs> Amalek has no redemption. That's what I'm going to explain to you now. So Rav Chaim Vital, who was a teacher, then a student of the Arizona League, he turns around and says, you know, based on this Tehillim, it talks about someone called Adam. Adam. Who is Adam? Who is, who is called Adam in the Torah? Well, there's Adam Rishon, but Yishmael is called a Pera Adam, a wild ass of a man. Now, is that a compliment or an insult? It's a little bit difficult to figure out. Because the other exiles are compared by the prophets to animals. And some of them are pretty ferocious. However, Yishmael is called an Adam, which is a nice thing. He's an Adam. But he's Pera. Pera means wild, unbridled, without limits. When they do it, they go all the way. They don't know how to stop. Now, we have this concept. Thank you for that. We have this concept called... Mesirat Nefesh. In Judaism, which means you give your life up for something. Vasa basically means you give money. I'm saying, right, you put yourself in a very challenging, difficult circumstance, but you kind of get through it. And you give your life up for something. You work hard on something. God bless you. You work hard on something. That's Mesirat Nefesh. But when Yishmaelim, <clears throat> meaning the Arabs and Muslims in general, by the way, when they do it, Mesirat Nefesh, they will throw themselves at it completely. Completely willing to even give their lives up for it. It's wild. We pray, they pray. We pray three times, they're up five times a day. We barely do their Yom Kippur. Everything they do is the extreme. There are two nations that we have encountered in history that have the word L in it. What does L mean, by the way? What does L mean? Power. Power. Right? Now, it refers to God. We use it as a name to refer to God, but it actually means power. That's why people get confused. They're like, what's that? There's a name of God, which is Elo with a him at the end, right? That's plural. Why is there a name for God? That's plural. And the answer is, I'll tell you why. Because Elohim, right, as we refer to it, means that God is the power behind all other powers. Now, do you want to pray to, pray to someone called power? You don't pray to Elohim. That's, that's tough. Unless the rabbis make us do it. That's God's attribute of judgment. It's tough. But there are two nations that have El in it. And they are Yishmael, which by the way is a beautiful name. Yishmael, God's going to listen. And Yisrael. We have this connection. We're very much connected there. Make no mistake, we have more in common with them in a spiritual sense. Unfortunately, not politically right now, although it's changing, there is the tide going back. Thank God that we are able to connect more to them than the Christians. That's why you are not allowed to pray in a church, or even enter a church, according to Jewish law, right? Because the church smacks over Vodah Zarah, idol worship, probably not full-blown out Vodah Zarah, but you walk in, and he's up on the wall, and his mother, home mishpacha, right? It's a problem, it's a challenge. But a mosque, you're allowed to pray in. And by the way, I've prayed in the mosque many times, and many of you as well, without even realizing it. Which mosque? Have you probably prayed without even realizing you did? Marat no, Machpelah no, no, no. in Hebron? They actually interchange you there. They could not do that with the Christians, but they can do that with the Muslims and allowed to be interposed. So he says the following. Listen very carefully, my friends, because this is happening right now. This is happening real time. I'm talking Instagram live. He says, at the end of days, there's going to be a fifth galut, number five. Khamsa. It's fun, right? You love your Khamsa. It's going to be a Khamsa, fifth <coughs> Galut. He says it's going to be the Galut of Adam, which is Para Adam. And they're going to come and they're going to be in Israel and we're going to have dominion over the land of Israel, which hasn't happened for 2,000 years. So that's a good prediction in and of itself. And the mission says we're going to have a government there. 
And he says that they're going to come and they're going to attack us. They're going to hurt us. And we're going to cry and we're going to cry and cry. By the way, it's a side point. <laughs> I just read a beautiful story from Tanakh. It's worth getting Tanakh out once in a while just to see how they deal with stuff in Israel. You know what I'm saying? Because if it happened then, it happens again. I'm going to tell you two quick stories from Tanakh. One of them is with David HaMelech. And David HaMelech was living in a place called Sikla. And he had 400 warriors, I believe, with him. And his two wives were there. And they had to go to war and they left the women there. And I think Mijan came and they came and they kidnapped all these women. They kidnapped them. <clears throat> Sound familiar? And David HaMelech came back from this battle and he saw that all of them had been taken. And do you know what they did? They cried and they cried. And Tanakh says they cried till there were no tears left. That's how much Bechia they did. But they didn't stop there. David Amalek said, we're going to get them back. And they went and they brought back every single woman, Shalem. Every single soldier's wife and his wife's too. Having said that, I want to share with you another story, which is unconnected, but connects to what we're dealing with today. <coughs> so I just got back from Israel, as I told you. I was there for this war thing, which I didn't anticipate, but it was... Now, we just were many, many times, Baruch Hashem, it was a life-changing event, you know? I made my wife and kids see things that you don't normally see. There is a story, my friends, of someone called Gidon. Story! In Shoftim, it's in Tanakh. And Gidon had to fight the Midian. For a long time in Israel, the Midianites were coming, they were hurting the Jewish people. And so Gidon said, I've had enough. I want to go fix them. So Hashem spoke to him, he was a Navi, he was a great prophet. This is an amazing story. He gathered together 33,000 men. I think that was the number. Or around that number. A lot of men. Hashem said, no, nah, too many. I mean, too many. You can't have too many people in an army. He says, no, because if, if you win with 33,000, everyone's going to think that I wasn't involved, says Hashem. And I want everyone to know that I'm involved in this war, which is a common thread in all Jewish wars. And therefore, get rid of some. Because, well, I'm going to get rid of them. He says, well, tell them if they're afraid. All right, see if they're, uh, you know, good people. So, so he says, fine, if you're afraid, or you spill the house, you've been busy, you go home. 20,000 gone. We had 20,000 dollars. Hashem's it. Still too many. But what should I do now? Does anyone know the test he gave? You know the test he gave? He says, take him down to the water. It's a story in, in scriptures. It's enough. And make them drink from the water. Anyone who bends down on both knees and puts their face inside and drinks that way, it must be they are Ovid of Orizara, the idol worshippers. And their merit's not good enough. Get rid of him. Get rid of him. He did that. He did that. But anyone who drinks and brings the water up, they can stay with you. What was the number they ended up with? 300. 300 soldiers. That's it. Imagine that. It's 300 soldiers. That's where I think they the Greek story, the 300. They get it from this story. Nothing they took from us. They just can't stop these people. 300 men. Now we've got 300 men with Gidon fighting, it must be tens if not hundreds of thousands. This is the story. I'm telling the story for a specific reason. And you're going to see one of You may not like it. I'm just warning you. But I'm telling you what happened. I'm giving you Jewish history. Don't shoot the messenger. No, I'm serious. Don't shoot the messenger. You guys went shooting today, right? Baruch Hashem. Very good. Don't shoot the messenger. And so, Dolomach went to a town, uh, Gidon went to a town called Sukkot. What's the name of this town? And he said, listen, we're chasing these kings. We've got to go get them. There's a whole enemy. We've got to get rid of them and rout them. Can you give us some food and water? And they're like, no. We don't want you to get involved in this. This is your battle. We're not involved. And he says, I'm warning you. You don't help out. Just don't fight with us. Just give us a little bit of flour water. My men are starving. 300. That's all we are. And they said, no. Because if you don't, we're going to come back and take revenge against you. This is his own people. These are Jews in Israel. And this is the prophet talking to them. They went to another town called Penuel or Peniel, I've forgotten exactly. Said the same thing. We have 300. We need food and water. We need bread. Just bread and water is all we need. We're fine. We're, we're beating the enemy for you. They turned around and they said, no, we don't want to get involved. It's not our business. Because we're worried the other team may win, maybe. Said the Chachamim, the rabbis explained that way. We don't want to put up. So we're not aligning ourselves. So he goes without them. He takes 300 men on an empty stomach or gets food from somewhere else, fights them, 
beats all the Midianites, comes back to Scott. Now, what do you think? Get on the great prophet would go, walks into Scott, and he says, What do you suggest? Oh, he made a big mistake, but let bygones be bygones. He doesn't. He takes the leaders, he strips them, he takes branches with thistles, and he beats them. He goes into Penuel, and he smashes down their big towers they built. And that's the story from tonight. And I don't know what it means, but I will tell you what I think. And that is, we've got to a point in history when you're at war saving your people, either you're with us or you're against us. And whether it means a little prayer, helping out in the synagogue, sending a vest, I don't know, something. Everyone's got to do something. And if not, public humiliation for you. That's where we are in history. Do something for your people. Because most Jews out there are not doing anything. Sorry to tell you. We're living in a bubble. It's a nice bubble. I live in the New York bubble. You live in the Miami bubble, but that's about it. But the rest, who knows where they are? They need to be included in this. This is an, an eight sarah for the Jewish people. And that's what Gideon, I believe, was telling us. And that's why we punished them. He was telling us a lesson. If you're not with us, you'll be punished in this world, as well as the next world. That's what we do. That was my aside. Back to Yishmael. So Yishmael is an Adam, and they have merit. What merit do they have? So listen to this unbelievable idea. I would never have guessed this myself. But Yishmael do certain things that bring them merit. One of them, is someone we mentioned at the beginning, which is why I made a big deal out of prayer, is they pray a lot. And Yishmael, God listens to their prayers too. Yishmael's a beautiful name. God listens to their prayers. So now we've got a problem, my friends. Because many of them, not all of them, but many of them are praying against us. So we've got to pray too. So now we've got this big battle, this big challenge. It's their tefillot against our tefillot. And who knows what they're praying for? Maybe they're praying chasfaklita for our downfall. Hashem's got an open... We don't have a monopoly on God. We have a monopoly on Torah. <laughs> now we have a monopoly on and mitzvot. But we don't have a monopoly on God. Hashem listens to the tefillot of all people. Make no mistake. It's the God of all the nations of the world. The one true God of Israel. And so if they're praying, we're going to have to be their prayers. We're going to have to cry a little bit more than them. And they're crying right now. So our cries have to be better than them. I'll be honest with you, I'm embarrassed to say. I'm a, a rabbi in, in, in Manhattan. And we had Elul. It used to be his stories. The old days, Elul came around, people were crying. I didn't cry, Elul. Comes along, Rosh Hashanah, right? Judgment. Had a great time, I guess. We had people that never celebrated before. Eating, drinking, enjoying, you know? It's far dim. We have a whole Seder going on over there, you know? I said a mitshuva. I didn't cry. I'm too busy figuring out my fundraising campaign for Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur comes. I don't really cry. I thought, mm -mm -mm, sorry, Hashem. You know what I did. Let's not discuss it right now. Just get rid of it. And then Sukkot. I'm having a good time sitting in Sukkot. And then this happens. Hashem says, oh, oh, oh. So you don't want to cry when I want you to cry. So I'll find a time for you to cry when you don't want to. And since Sukkot, everyone here, I'm sure, any, any Jew with a, a, a heart of flesh and blood has, 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 has shed a tear <coughs> from these, these, these stories and these, and these videos, which I don't recommend you watch. I stopped. I had a big discussion today with my good friend Yara Plotkin and Gay Plotkin. I came to see them. Baruch they do a tremendous amount of good. And she says, no, I watch everything. I have to watch everything. I say, I don't think it's good. I don't think it's good for people to do that. Okay. That's a little bit to Yishmael. They also get merit, by the way, for their tefillot, he says, and for Brit Milah. They do Brit Milah. They're Lomet Tzuva Oseh. They're not commanded. Lomet Tzuva Oseh, but they do it. However, and they do Tzniyot, right? They're very modest, but too much. You know what I'm saying? It's everything. It's, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's paradigm. It's what? They just go to extreme. But they get merit for that. Their merit, he says, is they get, you ready for this? He says, here's what, I'll show it to you inside. They get har habayit in olam hazeh in this world. Which makes, it's a crazy concept. Right? Temple Mount, they get in this world, but we get in the olam haba. Which makes you understand where Moshe Dayan, you know, when we conquered har habayit, right, Moshe Dayan, we had, you know, it was har habayit be a day. Remember the whole thing? You see the video, you understand? Right, the whole thing. Yeah, parents made you watch it or something. And he had the keys, and he gave it to the wakaf. 
It's probably the craziest decision in Jewish history. No, there is one crazier. Excuse me. <laughs> there is one crazier. What's the crazier decision than that? Just handing off the keys to our Disengagement. Yes. Yes. The only time in world history that a nation have kicked their own people off their own land <coughs> is in Gaza, is the Jewish people. It's an, you know no one's ever done that? You know how crazy that? You're like, yeah, sure. Right, land for peace. You know that we've never, no one's ever done that in world history? Five million times someone said, take my land, let's make peace. You're crazy. Who does that? It's so insane, it must be Minish mine. So that's the merit that Yishmael has. We have to beat that merit. That's just the way it is. That's the game. That's the game. So that's Yishmael. There's a good, there's an extreme, but there's a spiritual battle there. Yishmael caused us trouble. We know that, the Bnei Yishmael, the, the bad within Yishmael, they cause us trouble, but let's be honest. It makes sense, right? They want our land. They want our money. They're jealous of us. It makes sense, you know? I kind of hear it. The Midianites, the Moabites, they were scared. We're going to attack them. Don't come through our land. It kind of makes sense. It's a, I hear it. I don't like it. I don't like being attacked and killed and, you know, bombed. But I'm kind of hearing where you're coming from. But then there is a nation, my dear friends, who are still with us. Listen very carefully. Because they are out and proud right now. By the way, I had this big discussion with my wife recently. I don't know if I mentioned it. But I, I am shocked. And I've been around. I've come from England. I've seen anti-Semitism. You know what I'm saying? We used to grow up and they used to throw stuff at us and damn Jew, you know what I'm saying? And six men. We used to get a lot of that. You know what I'm saying? I'm still shocked by what's happening. I, I really am. And I don't think I'm a naive person. My wife is like, are you crazy? Of course. I mean, she comes from a Holocaust family. You know what I'm saying? The whole family got wiped out. So she's like, she grew up in this. This was part of the conversation, you know? So she's dealt with this. I'm still shocked. But the rabbi said us very clearly that before Mashiach comes and while he's here, he's going to have what's called Milchemet Hashem, the wars of God. And by the way, if he wins these wars, one of my students said to me, is it possible that Mashiach right now, because there must be, as we're going to prove to show you in a few moments, a potential Mashiach on deck at any moment. If Mashiach's going to come, it's going to be one potential Mashiach. It has to be. Right? It can't be a baby right now. What's going to do? So it's got to be someone. So could it be, someone said to me, could it be that he's right now fighting in Gaza somewhere? Is that possible? Is there a great Tzaddik fighting? Oh, I don't know. That's a great question. I don't know. Mashiach's identity is above my pay grade. I mean, I have an idea of who I think would make a great Mashiach. Right? I've got my opinions. I'm still Jewish. You know what I'm saying? So one of Mashiach's jobs is the wars of God. Now, I went to a very, very Haredi yeshiva growing up, an Ashkenazi yeshiva. That's where, you know, my friends were, so I went with them as well. So we always learned these are spiritual wars. And that was it. You know, that's how we learned things when I was in yeshiva. I'll tell you something. You read through the prophets, Ezekiel and Zechariah, right? Yechezkel and Zechariah. These are real battles, my friends. <laughs> these are big, fat battles. And Mashiach's going to be heavily involved in those. Whether, not directly, maybe directing it, I don't know exactly how. Until that happens, until this whole event, which already is happening actually, turns up on the stage of world history, we're not too sure. But there is one nation that's called Amalek. And Amalek don't want to kill us because of our money, or jealousy, or our land. They want to kill us because we are. That's it. That's Amalek. Now, Amalek are not idiots or barbarians. Moshe Rabbeinu had to deal with Amalek. You know, when the Jewish people left Egypt, as we said before in the Jewish year 2, 4, 4, 8, they walked through the desert, and they were on high. We just had a place, right? We beat off the Egyptians, and God took us out, and there we were, ready to receive the Ra and go to Harusi. And everything's fantastic. Comes along this nation called Amalek, and they're like, yep, we're here to kill you. We're, like, no, we're not going to pass through your land. We're not a threat on you. We're still going to kill you. But we're going to win because we've got Mashrabenu, we've got Aaron, right? we got Miriam. He's like, we don't care. Because but you're on a suicide mission. Like, we know we don't care. That's Amalek. Amalek are the people who are willing to kill us 
even knowing full well they're going to die in the process. I'll say that again. Who is our mother today? When you see people who are willing to die, who are willing to give up their own lives just to kill Jewish people, that's Amalek. And you see that in a couple of stories. First of all, with Mordechai and Esther and Haman. Haman is classic Amalek. Think about Haman for a second. The guy was very, very rich, very successful. He's got everything. But there's one thing he doesn't have, and there's this guy, by the way, Hmm. The Rambam says that the book of Megillat Esther is the only book from the prophets that is going to, and writings from Nach that's going to exist after Mashiach comes. Because it's a messianic story, he says. It's got tinges of Mashiach inside there for a number of reasons. Not for now. But one of them could be this. So there's how many has got whatever he needs. Money, wealth, people. And what does he do? One Jew, one annoying Jew, won't bow down to him. This Mordechai character. Why would Mordechai bow down to him? Who was Mordechai's great, 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 great grandfather? <laughs> Shaul, Saul. Watch carefully. Look at me. Yeah, King Saul from the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin, Benjamin. and he has a descendant called Mordechai Ish Yemeni from Benjamin. Okay. Then we have someone called Agag. Agag was the king of Amalek, and he's fighting. Shalom Amela. Shalom Amela is going to kill him. He doesn't. He lives in one more night. He's able to procreate that one night. And the, his great great grandson is Haman. Haman Haagagi, the Agagite. So this battle has traveled through history. And by the way, it's still traveling through history. It's going to come to an end. However, we changed the goalpost a little bit because Shaul Hamelech lost his kingship. And not only did he lose his kingship for not killing Amalek, which shows what a big job it was how important it is, it shifted from the tribe of Benjamin to the tribe of Yehuda. Yehuda. That's David Amalek. So David Amalek took over that mission as well. That's actually probably the biggest mission of Mashiach, is to wipe out Amalek. By the way, there's a very interesting question. <laughs> I must mention it. Where is Haman in the Torah? That's not my question. That's the question of the Gemara, the Talmud. What a strange thing. Where is Haman in the Torah? He wasn't alive when the Torah was written. How could there be a Haman in the Torah? And the rabbis give us an answer. They say, anybody know where he is? He's in Gan Eden in Bereshit. Exactly. He's in, very good. Hamina Eitz. There was a tree called the tree of good and bad, of knowledge, the Eitz Adat. And that tree is called Hamina Eitz from this tree. Hamin is Haman. Why is Haman referred to as that specific tree, right? And what's he doing in the Garden of Eden, of all places? Why is his name referenced? What is the Torah hinting at by telling us that Haman's origins come back to that first fateful decision of Adam and Eve, Adam and Chabad, to eat from that tree? Many answers, I'll give you just one. I want you to download this. The first mitzvah given to Adam and Chava was to eat whatever you want. Everything is yours. You have the entire world in front of you. But this one tree you can't have. What do they say? We want that tree. Haman has everything. He's so rich. He's so powerful. Right? He's second in command to Akashverosh, who rules over 127 provinces all over the world. Mahud Kush, he's got everything. But this one Jew drives him crazy. You know that's Amalek? Amalek are people who have so much and yet cannot enjoy it because they just hate us so much they're willing to give it up. They may have billions of dollars in their bank. They're not willing to share it with their own people because they want to destroy us. Enjoy, go on vacation. Go to Miami, hang out. Chill. They can't. The Nazis, Yamach Shaman, accepted. And there's many hints to this in biblical literature, actually, in the commentaries of the rabbis, that Germania, right, Germany, or Germania, as they change it into, I mentioned in my book, actually is a Nazi thing. Right? And the Nazis had everything. Right? They were successful at one point, and here they are, fighting wars on all four areas 
on all four fronts, and they're still willing to give their money, time, and effort to kill a bunch of Jews in camp. That is Midat Amalek. That's Midat, that is the treat of Amalek. Now, Amalek does not exist as an entire nation nowadays. There's no one walk around with a, hello, I'm Amalek, this is my flag. Because everything got mixed up. It was all Mugurbal, as we say. Right? So I'm mixed up all the nations. Whenever you see individuals, and by the way, it's not just in any one country, they're spread out through the entire world. They're in Russia, it's pretty obvious. Right? They're in France, they're in America. When you see people who hate us so much, they want to give up everything they have just to kill us on a suicide mission, that's Amalek. The word Amalek has the word, actually, the rabbis say, Malek is to Malek is to lick up. They want to just lick the Jews out of the world. Just get them out. Lick the blood of the Jews. But actually, there's a very interesting sacrifice in the Beit HaMikdash. It's called Melikat. You heard of this thing before? Very unusual. You take a bird, and the Kohen has a very sharp thumbnail, right? and they cut the neck of the bird, and they squeeze the blood, and come one of the sacrifices called Melikat, the separation of the head from the body. And they say, mm-hmm. That's a Malik. Malika Malik, same word. We can find a, a correlation between them, which is, which is the following. When a nation is extremely brilliant, like the Nazis, like Hamas, they're brilliant people, but they disconnect from the heart. They can do the most vile and disgusting things that you wouldn't even think of in your worst nightmare. That's a Malik. And when they act that way, says the Rambam, when they act that way, you have a mitzvah to go and wipe them out. Because there is no peace with these people. There's peace with the good of Ishmael. There's, there's peace with the Egyptians. That's possible, right? Everything. Saudis, Dubai, that's okay. We've had bad times with them. We've had bad times with everyone. But not Amalek. Bab Machteret is a parasha in the Torah. There's a parasha story, a, a set of laws in the Torah, that if someone tunnels into your home, Unless it's clear, like the, like the light of day, that they don't want to hurt you, you can assume that they do, and you can kill them first. Israel is our home. If they're tunneling in, which is exactly what the Torah is describing, you can go preemptively get them. Oh, by the way, who can you not get? So the Gemaras, the rabbis say, if your child breaks into your home, you assume they just want your money, right, and don't want to hurt you. So then you can't hurt. But anyone else who you're absolutely certain is a threat to your life, wipe them out. It's unpleasant. But that becomes your mitzvah. And that's why there is a mitzvah every day to remember what a Amalek did to us. Okay, we're together so far, friends. We did some Yishmael. We did some Amalek. Two very different things. Now, Amalek could be within Yishmael, but that's not the essence of who Yishmael is. By the way, as a side point, Yishmael himself that is the son of Abraham, through his wife Hagar, concubine I should say, he did to Shuva before he died. And the rabbis say, so too Yishmael, it's hard to say how, we're seeing it a little bit, at least Baruch Hashem, the good Yishmael is going to do to Shuva, is going to repent and come back at the end of days as well. That's one of the guarantees we're going to see. It's hard to see it, but we're starting to see with Abraham, of course Baruch Hashem, the good Yishmael are starting to come back and take a more um, pragmatic Right, solution to what's happening in the Middle East. It's all the build-up to this final moment. Okay. I want to just finish off with Gog and Magog. Has anyone heard the stories of Gog and Magog? So there are three prophecies in the Torah, two of them in Ezekiel and one in Zechariah. And this has become very, very popular, this topic now, because there's a lot of things that seem to be happening which seem to reflect the prophecies that describe this Gog and Magog. Truth is, we have no idea who they are. Actually, some say they aren't even an existing nation. One nation is going to come and take the role of Gog and Magog. Some say it's referring to Christians and Muslims. Bnei Esav and Bnei Ishmael are going to fight in the land of Israel, and the Jews are going to stand back and watch. I have to say, <laughs> nice try. It's actually the Jews going to be involved in it. It's going to be taking place in the land of Israel before Mashiach comes as well. Some say after Mashiach comes, there's a lot of uncertainty, but I will say one thing. Whoever these people are, again, we're not too sure to the turn up, but it's gonna be a big war in the land of Israel when the Jewish people have dominion over the land of Israel, which we have now for the first time in 2,000 years. So that's a big deal. 
I mean, you're living in biblical times, you don't realize that, right? You live in a world that, you know. Gog is the same word as Gog. What's Gog? I don't know, it was a roof. A roof. So there's a great rabbi called Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch. I was actually, he came from Frankfurt. I mean, I was actually in Frankfurt as a stopover on the way back from Poland this summer. And there was a very big, strong Jewish community over there that was trying very hard to uphold. And a lot of Ashkenazic Jewry today, especially the German Jewry, come from this, you know, this world of Rav Hirsch. Anyway, he says, this is going to be the battle of the roof people and the non-roof people. The Gog and the Magog. Who's that? What's the roof people? What do you think of roofies? What's going on over here? <laughs> see, I'll tell you what it is. You see, a roof denotes security and safety. You got a good roof. You know what you saying is? I got a roof above my head. It's a good sign. Means we're safe. We're good to go. He says that's not us, the Jewish people. What's our roof? What's our holy roof? The sukkah. The the sukkah. That's what we are. Is that a nice roof? No, it's not at all. It's a leaky, open, thatched hut. He goes, that's our roof. He says, at the end of days, we're going to see two groups of people. There are going to be two camps. Are you part of the roof people, or are you part of the sukkah people? And that's why we read about a lot of the prophecies of God Magog on sukkot. And so that's why everyone got very excited, because, well, in a bad way, unfortunately, but when this whole thing kicked in of sukkot, right at the end, Actually, Simcha Torah in Israel, and Shemiah and Sarah and Shabbat, they knew just the time to get us, didn't they? <coughs> Punked. Punked. They knew when to get us from Rahman Anyway, so that's an exciting time, but we talk about it then because there's an idea that Sukkot represents the final redemption, and all these wars are going to kick in around Hashanah Rabbah, Sukkot time. Well, that's what they say. So, what does that mean, roof versus non roof? What does that even mean? So, he says, I'll tell you what it means. It means that we're going to have a challenge at the end of days, which I work with a lot of young men and women, and some older ones too. And the challenge is not going to be so much financial, because for the most part, we're going to have wealth. That's why the bracha of wealth comes before, in the Amida, before the Mashiach brachot. Because we know the Mashiach is going to come and the Jewish people are doing well financially in the land of Israel. And the whole startup nation thing. That's why there's two brachot put next to each other. But he says, I'll tell you something. He says the problem before Mashiach comes is going to be emunah, faith. We're going to be taken in by other people's ideas and thoughts, and we are going to be challenged with great faith in God. It's going to be very, very difficult. And people are going to be attracted to other isms. Whether it be socialism, it used to be, or communism, that stuff's gone, right? All the other isms and many Jewish people are going to be attracted to that, thinking, ah, this is my truth. And by the way, he says, be very careful. Now, other people say this too. It's going to seem like they have the truth. It's going to be very, very difficult to distinguish and know who has the real emet. And there are going to be times, he says, and others say this, where you're going to be looking at the world and be like, it can't be that we're the chosen people. It can't be that we're because it's going so bad for us, and it's such a big challenge, and it's so... And we're going to see Jewish people flock to their side. And it's going to appear as though they're winning. That's what he said. And therefore, we're going to have to work hard on our emun, on our faith. Because we're dealing with people right now who have great faith, my friends. And this is the challenge of our generation. And I say our generation because I don't think our grandparents dealt with this. I think our grandparents had tremendous faith. Whether they were in Europe, or whether they were in Syria or Persia, that's why every Sephardi man, every Sephardi woman says to me, my grandfather was the rabbi back there. Who was the rabbi back in their town? <laughs> were they always like, oh no, no, back in Yemen. Oh my grandfather, big chacham. You go to those like Israeli restaurants, and you're like dubious whether it's kosher or not. Is it not kosher? And he puts up on the wall, is the foot of some old man with a long white beard. Of course it's kosher. This is my grandfather. <laughs> Of course it's kasher. I said, if he's serving me the shawarma and you're up on the wall, I'd eat here, right? It's the wrong way around, brother. They had real emunah, right? Did they know Hilchot Shabbat? Did they know how to read a Gemara, right? Did they know how to read Hebrew, right? My grandmother couldn't even write anything. And they had more emunah than pinky than we have in our entire bodies. 
It was an emunah pishuta. We make fun of them, right? Yeshiva didn't know anything. It puts to shame. That's what we need to build up on. And that's how I'm going. <coughs> and I'm not sure the solution to this. But I do know one thing. I don't know everything, but I do know that we get together and we pray together. But Rav Am Hadrad Melech says King Solomon, Shlomo Melech, when we get together and bring kavod by learning together and praying together and standing together and doing chesed together, we're on a much better track to building emunah among ourselves. You just feel that you feel Hashem's presence. And Hashem's presence in our generation comes through a multitude of people. That's the way it's going to be. It used to be they would sit, they would read, they would sit in some town by themselves and not see someone for like six months or six people in their town. And they were fine. We don't have that. We don't have that, that luxury. We need to be together. Because, my friends, if Sinat Chinam, baseless hatred, destroyed the second temple, and the first one, actually, then we know that Avat Yisrael is going to build the third and final temple, which we already told you is one of the proofs the Mashiach is Mashiach. I've overdone my time. I want to just review a lot of what we said. I have a lot more to say. Godwin, I'll come down to Miami again on vacation soon <laughs> to give you a lot more thoughts and ideas. <coughs> I said that we're living in biblical times right now. This is an amazing opportunity. It's an Ezra and Son. I brought some interesting proof of the Chumash about the years. You can believe it, not believe it. But the year we're in right now, everyone's got the feeling, Jews and non-Jews, right? I've... I, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to even say this, but I must tell you. So I have a, a, a fairly large social media presence, nothing crazy, until Facebook blocked me, and I had to get one of my students who worked for Meta to unblock me. Anyway, so some of my videos went viral. So I, I was reached out by an evangelical church in Vegas. And I realized something, you know, they're not like the when, you, when a shul reaches out to you comes, the people in the neighborhood, you know when the evangelicals reach out? They got thousands of them. There's so many of them. And this is a black church. And I, I got photos, there's a video of it. So they invited me on. So there's two of them up there. He's the prophet, and his wife's the doctor. And there's thousands of people in the audience, and they projected my face onto a screen. It wasn't pretty. And they sat there for an hour. Rabbi, just so you know, it's my, it's my American accent, by the way. Rabbi, just so you know, we're with you, and we love you Jews, and you're the chosen people. And he's going on and on. I'm like, wow. I speak to a Jewish audience. The rabbi doesn't know what he's talking about. He missed out the Gemara. He got wrong translation. What does he know? The Goyim, they have no Yitzhara. What can it be? Oh, rabbi, we're praying for you. I'm like, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Pray for my daughter. I'm trying to marry two of them off right now. Right? It's so good. The reach out. We've got, to, we've got to tap into this energy. It's a good thing, Baruch Hashem. All right, okay, fine. So they got like Jesus, Abu Rizara, thing going on. But leave that aside for a second. Baruch Hashem. Please, they pray for us. Hashem, this is all people. The jokes aside, it was a tremendous thing. I really felt, I felt that I was like, wow, there really, there's a, there's a sukkah that comes with this, you know? You have to appreciate this. I mean, if, they do, if they do say nice things, you say thank you. And if your local senator or your congressman does something good, write to them. They appreciate it. I write to them. And I'm a bit of a major, I'm a bit of a divonet, a bit of a crazy person. And when they do bad stuff, I'm like, hocking them like crazy too. I don't care. Right? I mean, you hit 50, I'm like that, man. Right? <laughs> And once the kids are all married off, I'm wearing a white sheet with a turban. I'm going full cult. I'm taking it right now. Forget this. I'm on cult right now. I'm going full Sephardi rabbi again. I'm just telling you. I'm going to marry the kids off first, get them out of the house, and then we'll go back. <laughs> so we see the people come to us. You give a thank you. Because the world's against us. We've seen crazy things. My family's in London, 100,000 Jews walking across the bridge, shouting free Palestine. They don't even know what Palestine is. They couldn't put Gaza, you paid a million dollars. What do they know? They're idiots. They know nothing. River, sea, water, river, water, sea. What do they know? What do you do with it? You still a sakana? And this is the time for achdut? This is the time to pray? Hakara to talk to those people who give us their thanks? This is the time to go after the Jews who've been funding universities? Right? Like Brooke knows. Right? Give me the minute. They're like, oh my God, I had no idea. Come on, buddy. You didn't see this? I mean, I'm on campuses every week. I'm seeing this stuff. Let them know. Talk to your friends. Bring them into a shiur. You know, one last story. I'll finish with this. I'm sorry, Mechila. This is my therapy. <laughs> we brought so with all the soldiers were there next to the hotel. So we're bringing them food, bringing them drinks. And a lot of them, but there's no seats. 
enough seats for the thousands of soldiers who were shipping up to Aza, right, who were turning up, by the way, by taxi, or their parents, or their bus, you know? And they don't go pick them up door to door. And they turn to Tachan Mokas at the central bus station and sitting on the floor. Happens to be Yerushalayim, it's a lot of religious kids. They're sitting on the floor, Shabbat, Shemini, and Seris, and the Torah. In the army fatigues, reading to Ilim. What an embarrassment to us. What a bush us what our brothers and sisters are doing. How they're spending their Simchat Torah, sitting on the floor, with their parents dropping them off, crying, that killed me. Their parents dropping them off, religious parents leaving Beth Kenneth, leaving the synagogue, leaving the nuns, crying for them. That's when I cried. That when I saw the parent, that was it, because I'm a parent, oh, I'm done. Chalas, it's all over. This is what they're doing for us. So you shed a tear. Friends, God willing, we're going to see the end of Amalek very soon, Bizra Hashem. We're going to see Yishmael only bring out the good and do to Shuvah. We're going to see Gog and Magog is going to be wiped away very, very quickly. We're going to, God willing, Bizra Hashem very soon, all return to Eretz Yisrael, Bishlemut, with Ava and Simcha. And as the Prophet finishes, Bayamahu Yad and Ayachad, Ushmo Ayachad, Gosling, Fan, be one, Bizrat Hashem. I wish you and your Kehillah tremendous success and Brachot. Keep doing what you're doing, and we'll see Samachot very soon, Bizrat Hashem. Thank you.